Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. It is our great privilege to have with us this evening Mr. Grant Palmer. He is a uh, retired member of the LDS Church Education System. He has been an LDS Institute Director and number, held a number of other posts in a 34-year career there. Um, he is also the author of An Insider's View of LDS Origins, excuse me, Mormon Origins. Uh, it is a privilege to have him with us, Mr. Palmer. Great to have you. Thank you. When I go to the LDS Apologetics website fair, and I look at their review of your book, I see that they seem to take great exception to you calling yourself uh, an insider. Now, I can understand them being upset about my, me calling myself an insider. I've never been a Latter-day Saint, but what do you think qualifies you as an insider? Well, I suppose it depends how you uh, define the word, and uh, you know, if you want to get really technical and and define it narrowly, then maybe I'm not. But I would say I am. I'm four to six generations uh, uh, on all sides. Uh, my great uncle Charles H. Hart was a, was a general authority, first quorum of seventy. Uh, I grew up with a number of uh, apostles and knew some of the presidents of the church. They were in my home. My parents were friends with them. But the 34 years teaching uh, uh, mainly LDS Institute uh, classes, I I feel um, qualifies me to be called an insider. I, I agree. I think it's ridiculous to to challenge that. I mean, I mean, I, who do they consider to be an insider if not someone like yourself? I mean, you have to be a general authority to be an insider. Do you actually have to come to have lived during Joseph Smith's time or what? But. Uh, tell us a little bit. Now, you, you say that you're multi-generation LDS. Your, your ancestors go back to the pioneers. Uh, you grew up in the LDS church. You served your mission? Yes. Yes, I uh, served the LDS mission in uh, Virginia, North Carolina. In 1962, our mission led the world in convert baptisms and uh, for the LDS church, and I was very much a part of that. From there, is that what led you into the church education system? Yes, I was so imbued with uh, the spirit of, uh, of uh, missionary work that I, uh, I wanted to do it for a living, and I did. So you believe that you had a, a, a solid testimony? Oh, uh, very much so, yes. So what kind of work did you do uh, in the church education system? Well, I started out in uh, the Church College of New Zealand, and I, I really was hired to go over there to teach British Empire history and to high school students, and, uh, and then uh, taught some, a class or two of junior high science. And then when one of the religion teachers went home, I, I kind of moved into his position. And from there, I was hired into the institute program of the LDS Church. So you've taught in institute classes. Well, mainly, I've been an institute director, you know, three different times in my 34 years. Uh, I did have, uh, I did come to Salt Lake because my uh, wife's mother was ill, and I did take a seminary position for about uh, seven, seven and a half, eight years, and I became a much better teacher when you have to teach high school kids <laughs> than teaching university students. So you, you've, you've served a range of, of, of callings in the, LD, in the LDS church education system. Yes, I would say so. Uh, institute director, seminary coordinator, uh, uh, LDS chaplain, uh, uh, at least those, those three callings. You've also had callings within your, your local ward, haven't you? Yes, I was uh, on the high council. I was elders quorum president, Sunday school president, young men's president, uh, gospel doctrine teacher, temple officiator, uh, done a good deal of it. Now about the time that you came back to Salt Lake, uh, that was about the same time that the Mark Hoffman things were going on, wasn't it? Well, I came back in, uh, in 1980, and about 1984 is when the Hoffman letters began to circulate and so forth. Now that piqued your interest as someone who had been studying uh, LDS history? Well, it did. Uh, you know, I knew about uh, several of the uh, uh, 
that Joseph Smith had seen something like a salamander or something like a toad. There's several references to that. And one of the senior historians at BYU was asked to, uh, to help uh, Mark Christensen at the time who had bought and purchased the uh, Phelps Harris Salamander letter to do research on it. And he'd come across this, uh, this uh, short story, I guess you could call, uh, call it, uh, called the E.T.A. Hoffman's The Golden Pot. And he said to me, he says, Grant, uh, he says, I've read this. Uh, would you read it and let's get together and have a discussion about, about what, what is found? And so he did that, but I read the piece seven times and he says, well, did you see all these parallels to the Joseph Smith story? And I says, yes, but there's a lot more there. And, uh, and uh, it, it just surprised me. And, and we've really never had an adequate explanation as to where the angel gold plate story of Joseph Smith may have come from. Uh, it could be his own experience, or it could be uh, certainly treasure lore as part of that story. Uh, I personally am not sure we, we know exactly what happened, but this story of the golden pot uh, has a very similar kinds of uh, identifiable things that Joseph Smith talked about. For example, he, uh, the young man in this story is, is a theological student called of God, and yet he's, uh, uh, his lo ordinary life is quite boring, and so he gets off into these, these fantasy uh, spells, and uh, he has a dream three times in one night that he's going to, to enc encounter an ancient being, an, a, an ancient archivist, and he will be able to translate the record of the Atlanteans. And... Uh, but he can't do it for monetary reasons, he can't do it uh, for selfish reasons, and so he eventually passes the test and gets the record and translates it. Um, what intrigued me about that story is that this young man, his name is Anselmus in the story, he, he dreams about it three times in one night. Now to a treasure adept, that means you're going to get the record, the treasure. You go up to mm -hmm. Vermont. Uh, what intrigued me was the next morning he has a fourth vision and it's uh, under, a, under a, an elder tree and uh, he encounters this being again, just like Joseph Smith. What intrigued me was in this story, The Golden Pot, it's all done in a dream. The three in one evening and then the f next day, still in a dream, he, um, he encounters uh, this archivist in the form of a salamander who rises up and, and beats him up, basically. Well, that, that's kind of what Joseph Smith... So the thought occurred to me, I wonder if, if he, he's using that story. Uh, it, it was in the environment. We think we may have known who introduced it but we're, we're not certain. But no one has ever explained where this story that Joseph Smith tells c came from. Is it is his own experience or is it the folklore that was in his environment? Was this story influencing him? And I don't know that we know the, the full answer to that. But, I, but what I would say is that I think that, that when Joseph Smith talks about dreaming three times in one night and then he wakes up from the dreams and then he, or visitations, I think they later became. Then he went to the hill, and then he's, he encounters something like a toad, and it comes into a scary old man and beats the living daylights out of him. And to me, those kind of things happened in dreams. They don't happen in reality. So let, let's go back now. The, the Hoffman letter was actually a forgery. It but, was. But what was the gist of the story there? I mean, it was Martin Harris and Phelps corresponding, and Martin Harris communicating to Phelps supposedly what had happened to Joseph? Correct. And these kinds of mystical uh, yes. spins on things. Which well, something like a toad, uh, I forget the exact wording in the salamander letter, something like a salamander, or okay. a salamander appeared, changed into a form, and and abused, physically abused, Joseph Smith. 
So when this letter arises, it seems to set off a couple of different things in motion. One is people start researching and they find that there are other accounts yes. uh, that c correspond to this kind of mystical, magical view of things that's clearly within LDS um, sphere of things. Yes, and, one, and once it was shown to be a forgery, the Salamander letter, the senior historian I mentioned earlier, we just dropped that and went on because we had three or four other, uh, something like a toad and so forth. In fact, Michael Quinn found one that had been, uh, he'd interviewed uh, the Saunders, which were Joseph Smith's uh, parents' friends, mm -hmm. and uh, he'd he was very open about it. He, he, they, they thought a lot of the Smiths had no axe to grind. And, he, and, Joseph, and this Benjamin Saunders says, Joseph told m my mother and me while I, we were in the kitchen that something like a, a toad had uh, raised up and beat the heck out of him. Uh, some transmogrified bean. And so Mar or, uh, Michael Quinn had found that reference once we started looking, and I had found one in even later that that appeared in the New York uh, one of the New York papers and Quinn and I swapped each those so we had those two plus we had Willard Chase's uh, something like a toad and we had a lot of references by Emma's cousins the Lewis's in uh, out of um, out of Harmony Pennsylvania so we had a, a, a quite a few references to this so so you've got this this line of evidence for this kind of thinking within LDS circles, but what you were referring to earlier was actually from E.T.A. Hoffman's uh, story, The Golden Pot, in terms of what might have influenced. Yeah, I, I think it thing. had an influence, and see, no one's ever, ever, uh, I, I put that chapter in my insider's view of Mormon origins, not so much to prove a point, but to make a point. No one had ever outlined exactly. I, I find a lot of chronological parallels, I think on maybe 20 or 30 story items and uh, of course Joseph gets his golden plates on the fall equinox and so does Anselmus he gets these ancient records on the fall equinox and there's just a, a number of of, uh, of motifs that uh, chronologically uh, seem to fit now some people will agree that they're there and some say well it's not as strong as it could or should be uh, I think there's something to it, and so did the senior historian from BYU. We think there's something there. But I think he's influenced by whatever happened to him himself, plus the treasure law of the day, plus perhaps this short story. Now let's back up a little bit. These are some of the questions that get raised in terms of uh, having doubts about Joseph Smith being what the, the, the church puts forward now in, in the modern histories. Mm -hmm. When did the issue start getting raised for you that maybe what was being presented, I mean, you know, like the, the pictures that are put in the ensign of Joseph Smith with the plates and, tra and translating, things like that, you found that that wasn't actually what the contemporaries were seeing at all, was it? No, in fact, we've got about 22 statements from scribes, relatives, passerbys, and it's always a stone in the hat, no plates are around. It's his his uh, relatives, um, his own family, Emma's parents. We do not have any primary references that said that he ever used the, the golden plates, ever. Now there are, so you've got this picture of Joseph Smith taking the hat, putting stones in the hat, and pulling the hat up, up to his face, and supposedly mystically the uh, translation appears, the plates actually weren't even present. Were no, they? no, they, they all said that they knew, his own father said they were out in the, the woods or they were, they were hidden in a uh, uh, sugar sack or they were out in the woods or uh, the angel had them under custody. I mean, there's, they were on the mantle, the fireplace, his own wife said. But no, no one ever uh, saw him using them. Now there's another event that took place prior to, to Hoffman sort of piquing your interest in some of these Mormon origins. Uh, you grew up during the time that the church recovered the papyri for uh, the Book of Abraham, didn't you? you yes. During that time. Yes, 1967, 68. 
uh, there was a huge build-up cover story in the what was then the improvement era yes pictures of the papyri uh, a, a, a year-long series of articles uh, that didn't go anywhere no, in fact, uh, Hugh Nibley, who did the articles, said he was just stalling for time so he could uh, learn Egyptian, so he could translate uh, the papyri, and uh, I think he went back to the Oriental Institute of Chicago and studied with Klaus Baer and maybe some others, Parker, Wilson, I don't know. Um, and then he basically came out and says, well, it's an Egyptian endowment, it doesn't has nothing to do with Abraham, and basically skirted the issue. Uh, you've had Charles Larson on your program, I believe, and he mm -hmm. takes a little different approach to the Book of Abraham than I do, and his is certainly legitimate. Uh, he, he, he talks about, look, there's no Egyptologist who, who uh, supports what Joseph Smith has, has done, and then he gets into the Egyptian alphabet and grammar. I take a little different approach, and I says, well, in my book, chapter one, I say, well, where did he get the material in? And I think we can account for 100% of all the ideas that are in the book of Abraham from, from five different sources. And if you, uh, um, you, you get a lot of spin on this from uh, people that are on the payroll of the church, especially at BYU, but uh, I, th I think we can, chapter one, which is Abraham's story, where he, he goes into Egypt, and then uh, his life is uh, going to be taken by the Pharaoh, and then he teaches him astronomy, and then he sits on the throne, as facsimile three shows in the Pearly Great Prize. Uh, that's right out of Josephus, I do believe, and uh, Joseph Smith's family owned an 1830 copy of Josephus. I think that's where he's getting chapter one. Uh, chapters two, four, and five are, are the use of a King James Bible in a, a 1769 edition or later printing, and it contains 86% of those three chapters, chapter two, four, and five of the book of Abraham. There's only five chapters. And 86% uh, of that comes right out of the King James Bible, including the errors in that particular edition. So we know where he's getting the material. Um, that leaves chapter 3, which is astronomy. And J Joseph Smith, uh, I think he got a lot of that material from Thomas Dick's philosophy of a future state. The Smith, Joseph Smith owned a copy of that book, an 1830 edition. Uh, Oliver Cowdery writes about it in the then ensign uh, um, called The Messenger and Advocate. But the point is, no matter how you spin this thing, you can take those three facsimiles, uh, and Joseph Smith paid $2,400 for this material when they were building the Kirtland Temple. That's the equivalent of $61,000 in today's uh, money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And yet, the apologists would say, well, he, he just had it by revelation. But the point I think that they need to address is no matter how Joseph Smith received his interpretations of facsimile one, two, or three, and fill in how you want him to do it, mm -hmm. he's wrong. You begin to see these various things. You're working in the church education system. Did uh, you just cease to believe it? One, I mean, at, at some point years ago. Oh, you, you put you, things on the proverbial shelf, and then you, you know, you do some more research because you, you love what you're doing, and you prepare lessons, and you find things. And I guess it was just a slow buildup over the years. But uh, yeah, facsimile th two, which is that hypocephalus in the in the Pearly Great Price, uh, Thomas Taylor's. Uh, 1816 book called The Six Books of Proclus on the Theology of Plato. There's four or five or six phrases that are exactly the same or almost exactly the same that are right in the explanation of that facsimile. So I, I don't know. I know that these are all 19th century sources and the, and the astronomy is Newtonian. It is not uh, it is not uh, 
correct. You could ask any BYU physicist. They will not defend it. Uh, Einstein's uh, structure of the universe is, is, is what is held sway, and this is a Newtonian science, and it's been thoroughly discredited. You still wanted to believe, though, didn't you? Oh, very much so, yes. In fact, I went to a lot of BYU professors that I knew who were historians, and they almost all would say, yes, we have problems, and uh, we don't have very good answers, and so forth and so on. Um, I talked to a lot of them. You finally came to a point where you had to go to your boss and ask to serve in a different function. I asked to go to the Salt Lake County Jail uh, because I... I just, I was so troubled by all of this that I asked to go. He knew what my problems were. And uh, at the jail, I was to teach only biblical materials, and that worked fine with me. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just uh, continue my research and not be so frustrated and having to stand up in a uh, classroom and teach things that I, I had problems with. Yeah. So they knew about it, and I've been really maligned on that one, but that's the truth. And you essentially reached a point where you retired early. I retired, retired four years early. Exactly right, yes. And uh, now the spin that we hear from a lot of folks is that the only reason anyone would write anything critical of the LDS Church is for money or because they're embittered people. Well, I'm certainly not embittered. I, I just think that only the truth's good enough for Latter-day Saints. And uh, uh, I've offered to make changes if they could show me where I was wrong and no one's ever stepped forward. Uh, I, I think truth is important. It seems as, as if most of your critics are more concerned with trying to attack you personally than the content. Well, that's certainly the case. Uh, uh, farms and Fair, I think they had seven or eight articles on me, and they spilled as much ink as is in that book right there that, uh, in Insider's View. And it took them a year to do it, so I got two of our very best historians, and I says, look, they've spent a year working on this. I want you two to independently read and critique that, and if there's anything in there you think that is valid, I'd like to know about it, and the next edition will change it. They both came back to me, and these are really top-flight historians, they're, they're, and, and they both says, you know, there's really nothing there on the surface. There's one or two items, but when you get a little deeper into it, they're wrong. I want to go ahead and open up our phone lines. If you'd like to join in the conversation, we have with us Grant Palmer. He is retired Institute of Religion director from the uh, LDS Church. He is the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. I think it's important, I mean, I, we've been talking around things that make great sense to me because I've read the book, but it seems as if you've got two basic things going on. One is you've got sort of a popular history of the LDS Church mm -hmm. that you know, Joseph Smith goes into the grove to pray. He, you know, very set, very clear chronology, very clear uh, visions, all these various things. You begin to find out that's not so neat. And then as you begin to question, then you begin to see that Joseph Smith actually could have written the Book of Mormon. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the first and on the second. We have a lot of folks that believe that it had to be uh, it had to be Solomon Spalding. It had to be um, oh my mind just went who was the Sidney S Rigdon. S Sidney Rigdon. Uh, it had to be someone other than no. Joseph I think Smith. he's very capable. And the Book of Abraham leads a trail directly to the Book of Mormon. And if we had time this evening, we could talk about where each section of the Book of Mormon came from. But one of the things that motivated me to write is when I was doing my PhD in colonial history and American history at BYU, I did a lot of work in the Second Great Awakening, and I was utterly amazed that uh, the 11 preachers in the Book of Mormon, starting with uh, 
Jacob and Enos, clear up through Alma too. That's a good chunk of the Book of Mormon. They were second great awakening speakers. They, Joseph says he went to these revivals as often as he could. He inclined towards the Methodist. You see Methodist doctrine, approach, style, conversion patterns. Uh, it, it just knocked me over. I, I was absolutely shocked at uh, how similar all of that was. And that's just one section of the Book of Mormon. I put that in chapter 4 here. But the King James Bible is probably represents 25% of the Book of Mormon. A lot of Mormons aren't aware of that because they don't know the Bible that well. But I'd say 25% from the Book of Mormon, or the, from the Bible. Another 25% from uh, Evangelical Protestantism, mainly Methodist. And that's 50%. And then another... Uh, three influences would account for another 25%. So 75% of the book came right out of his backyard, and I think it's clearly a 19th century work. But don't take my word for it. Go ahead and do your own research. Uh, Smith family biographies in there, uh, anti-Masonic stuff, which has filled the election of 1828 with Andrew Jackson, who was a Mason, and the newspapers were filled with what will happen if a mason gets in the executive branch of government? What will he do there and to the courts? And you see those themes running through uh, Third Nephi and Helaman. Uh, the war chapters are another matter. But anyway, suffice it to say that 75%, I think, we can make a pretty cogent case that it came right out of Joseph Smith's environment. And he's very capable. The things that he knew about is what appears in the Book of Mormon. It's striking to me as a Presbyterian that if you understand 19th century Presbyterianism, you see this attack over and over in various forms. I forget the group that, that builds the high platform, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically a high pulpit. Yes. Which you would have had in a congregational or Presbyterian church. And you know, the attacks on the paid, uh, on, on paying pastors who work full time. Mm -hmm. to actually put food on their family's table. Uh, you know, it is it is this radical Second Great Awakening Methodist. Oh, totally. And I found that the King Benjamin speech is what you're kind of referring to. Uh, one year before Joseph Smith uh, gets the play, or, yeah, 1826, in Palmyra, there was a big revival there, and a guy named Bishop McKendry came in and he was looked upon as a sainted man and the whole Ontario district came to hear him. He was feeble, he was, uh, and he talked about uh, the whole plan of salvation and everybody on the grounds adjoined except children. This is a dead ringer for, for there, there's even one of the preachers on the stand named Benjamin and they're, they have their tents in a horseshoe just like Benjamin did and on and on the parallels go. He's feeble but he's, you know, uh, and then after the, after the speech, they're assigned to the stations of the preachers, and that's the very word that's used in the Book of Mormon uh, when, when these uh, missionaries, Aaron and Ammon and so forth, later go. It, it just, it's really filled with Methodist. Uh, but, but that was one of the things that influenced me to take a serious look at the Book of Mormon is these 11 preachers between the... Uh, uh, Jacob Enos and up through Alma 42 and, and it was the language, the, the King James usage, the frontier metaphors, they're, they're just all there. This is not an ancient record, this is a 19th century influence and a major influence at that. One of the first critics in writing of Joseph Smith was Alexander Campbell. Mm. Uh, Sidney Rigdon had been a Campbellite uh, pastor and led his congregation that had split from the Campbellites into the Mormon yes. church. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard something like 3,500 of the first Mormons were out of the Campbellite, not, not the first. Well, the New York Mormons, almost all of them were into treasure digging. Okay. But once you go to Ohio, yes, Isaac Morley, Rigdon, the Pratts, Partridge, they are definitely coming out of the Campbellite uh, influence. Alexander Campbell said that Joseph Smith in basically one fell swoop had answered all the questions of the day on baptism and church yep. government and paid clergy and all these yep. these other things. And it, I mean, it just sticks out like a sore thumb that it's it's a very contemporary thing, answering the modern questions, 
using the modern language, I mean, and, and using language that uh, you pointed out that the 1769 King James had some errors. And they trans and they're right in the Book of Mormon. This is a, this is a, you know, they fluff it off, but it's it's a serious concern. I want to say one other thing. Um, so anyway, the the eleven preachers when I was working at BYU, um, as a part time, uh, considered half faculty and half working on the PhD. That's what jumped out at me on the Book of Mormon, and it was something new to me. The other thing that jumped out at me, when I started looking at the four foundational visions, and that represents the last four chapters of the book, is that uh, it wasn't just one of the four. And the four are the, the eight and three witnesses, especially the eight, and then the angel gold plate story, and then the priesthood restoration in the first vision. What jumped out at me there, after I looked at all the different versions, is that uh, they became more and more impressive, unique, physical, uh, yes, miraculous. They, they follow that pattern. Not, not one of them, but all four. And I was ready to excuse, uh, you know, if there's only one of them that has this kind of embellishment development, but to find all four. And the priesthood restoration and the first vision, uh, impressive accounts, the miraculous ones especially, came after Joseph Smith had a serious confrontation with his own leadership and they wanted to know, and then he came out with these more miraculous versions. So that was another impetus, impetus for the book. Well, before we get too far on that, let's go ahead and take our first call. We have with us Dale from West Valley. Dale, good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, my question is, is very simple. It sounds to me like from what I've been hearing that what is actually being stated is, is it possible that Joseph Smith plagiarized the Book of Mormon? Uh, Thank you for your call. Yes, I, I, I think to sum it up in a sentence, you could say that the Book of Mormon is essentially a ripoff of 19th century Christianity. The, the, the book that you mentioned uh, prominently in, in here is uh, Ethan Smith's view of the Hebrews. Um, I've heard some people, I think, go too far in trying to say that it's a copy of that. But I think that you do a good job in terms of qualifying that shows that long before anyone ever heard of the Book of Mormon, people were speculating that the mm -hmm. American Indians were actually Jews. And Ethan Smith, who was the Congregationalist pastor of the Pratts, right? Uh, Elder uh, Cowdery. Cowdery. I, time I said it, I knew I said it right. Up in Vermont. <laughs> right. Uh, Cowdery's were members of Ethan Smith's uh, congregation. Oliver Cowdery, uh, one of the three witnesses uh, yes. to the Book of Mormon. Uh, his pastor writes this book in 1825? 23 in the 23. second edition in 25, and it just okay. swept through New York. It was very popular. It was discussed at the drugstore, that kind of thing. In fact, B.H. Roberts, who was an LDS General Authority, First Quorum of Seventy, said that uh, there is a great probability that Smith said uh, encountered this book. And, uh, and Again, I don't think Joseph's getting too much of the content from that, but maybe the storyline, that's what B.H. Uh, Roberts suggested. Uh, for those who don't know about Ethan Smith's uh, book, the outline basically says the following, that a group of Israelites, a colony of Israelites in about 600 B.C., as I recall, might be off a little bit there, but about 600 B.C., uh, came, I think, from... I was thinking Rome, but they were Israelites, and they had a tough ocean cro crossing. They came to the Americas, and then they soon broke into two factions, a civilized and an uncivilized fac faction, and they had many long wars, and uh, there's a Christ figure in there throughout the book, and then in the end, the uncivilized uh, group completely annihilates the, the civilized group. Well. That sounds a lot like the storyline of the Book of Mormon if you had to shorten it up. Uh, it, but, the, but Ethan Smith's view of the Hebrew is not an early draft of the Book of Mormon. And 
I, I personally don't believe that Spalding had much, or Rigdon had much to do with the Book of Mormon. I don't think you can make that case stick. All the historians I know don't give it much credit. Uh, the evidence would point that they met, Rigdon met Smith after the Book of Mormon was published, not before. Although there's some, there's some reminiscences, reminiscences to that, my research would uh, reject that. And the people who try to speculate that there was actually this um, lost manuscripts of, uh, of Solomon Spalding, you would reject that as well? Yeah, and I don't know uh, any historians who put much credence in that idea. Okay. We're going to go to Matthew in Salt Lake. Matthew, good to have you with us. Hi, I've got a, I've got a question uh, that, that maybe you or uh, Mr. Palmer could uh, address. Um, I don't know if you two saw it, but a couple of nights ago, on uh, one of the local television stations here on the on the 10 o'clock news, uh, they did an interview with uh, one of the uh, one of the general, actually one of the uh, quorum of the 12, and uh, it was uh, Ballard. And uh, three or four times in that uh, interview, it was a five-minute piece or whatever. I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that he said it three or four times. I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he he I mean he really wanted to be sure that that no one missed that and I was just wondering is he is he does he believe this uh, is he uh, is he uh, sincere in, in, in believing that and uh, what what is your take on on somebody that uh, is so forthright in uh, in making such a statement thank you thank you in your experience uh, do many people, even in leadership in the LDS Church, really know much about the history? No, I don't think so. Uh, they know our best historians are disturbed, but I don't think they look beneath the veneer. I think that's probably is about, about it. They certainly are learning about it because a lot of people are telling their bishops and stake presidents. I assume that filters up. I did not see the interview with Elder Ballard. Uh, I was in Africa, and uh, but my, my uh, strong sense is that they, they truly believe in what they're saying. They do. I don't know that they meet the criteria of apostles. If you go to Acts 1, uh, when Judas loses his bishopric, it says, uh, and they were going to replace him, Peter outlines the criteria for who can replace him, and he mm -hmm. simply says they have to have witnessed the baptism of John, they had to witness the ministry of Jesus, the two or three year ministry, they had to have witnessed the, the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And they came up with two individuals who had met that criteria. Uh, it's easy for me to see how you really probably couldn't have apostles on the earth very long because who could meet all those qualifications? And then once they had these two men, uh, is it Matthias and who's the other one? Search of the B, Bar uh, um, Barnabas or Bar Barabbas or something? Uh, something I mean, like. I'm, this is the fun of live TV. I, I'm drawing a complete blank. Yeah. I remember it's Matthias, but... He's the one that was chosen. Right. But at that point, they simply chose him by what we would call flipping quarters or drawing Cast, straws, drawing lots is what they call it. The most important part of that was that he met the criteria. So, uh, you know, there's lots of apostles. I, I think there's over a hundred who are claiming to be apostles. The, the Strangites claim to have 12 apostles. This, this group down in Manti has 12. The RLDS 12 has 12. The LDS has 12. The, uh, it, it, Church of Christ Temple Lot. I, I met one of their yeah, apostles. Yeah, I, I met them too. And so you start, well, there, there's, there's lots of people claiming that they're apostles, but they don't meet the historic uh, qualifications as outlined by Peter in Acts 1, and I think that's important. But I, I, I think they would say today, and they may have changed this a little bit, they're not so much special witnesses of Christ, but they're special witnesses to the name of Christ. That's a recent... Uh, emphasis that, that I've heard about. Now, but, but I think he's sincere. He believes it. I've talked to our LDS apostles. They believe it. The Church of Christ lot back in Independence. He believes it. 
Yeah, they invest a lot of their, their time and everything else. If you'd like to join in the conversation, our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. We have with us Grant Palmer, the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Now, it's hard to speculate about people's motivations. Uh, we can't read people's hearts. You believe that Joseph Smith could have written the Book of Mormon and these other th things. Why? if you had to speculate from what you've seen. I mean, um, do, you, do you think he was doing it as a fraud, as a, as a, as a swindler? Do you think he was um, self-deceived? I mean, obviously, if you can't do it for someone who's living, it's even harder to try to do it for someone who's dead. But what well, in, I, th what I think he wrote the book just with exactly why, what he said in the, in the introduction pages to bring people to Christ. I think he was sincere in that. I think, for example, he went to, to New York in, in uh, 1832 and he writes a letter back to Emma and he is really, really distressed. He says, all I see, every countenance has wickedness in it. This, New York City has, uh, what, 350,000 people in, uh, in, in 1832. And he says, I, I walked the streets and I was just, boy, they all deserve to, you know, to to go to hell. I, I mean, he's really exercised until he he can no longer stay out on the streets, and he comes back to his uh, apartment and and stays there. He is he's really worried about uh, people not accepting Christ. And in 1800, only seven percent of uh, Americans belong to a church. So I think he's 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 motivated there. I, I see elements of sincerity and fraud in Joseph Smith when. When he goes up to get those plates in 1827 on, on the equinox, he, I think he had to make a decision. Uh, okay, it begins. Do I say I get, I get these plates and they're for real or not? Uh, I don't, I, I think B.H. Roberts was probably right about that, that the plates were psychological with Joseph Smith. They weren't real plates. Although he goes to the effort to put them in a, uh, a pillowcase or what have you, and uh, I think he did that to enhance belief. But the very fact that all these ancient Nephites took all that time to uh, to uh, uh, do this writing on hard, difficult writing, and yet he doesn't use the material is 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 a real question mark. Yeah, the one of the things that's often said is that. You know, Martin Harris left the church and Oliver Cowdery, but but they never they never uh, took back their testimony. Well, that's a good one, all right. Uh, n you know, uh, a lot of those men. Now, ha Martin Harris is probably the most strange of all. He was, I think, he joined five or six groups before Mormonism and seven or eight after, including seances. He mm -hmm. got into seances, sent to Brigham Young. Look, I've seen Elias. I've seen Moses. Uh, when Gladden Bishop, and was it 1845, he's, he's going to have witnesses to his plates. In fact, he claims to get plates, and his daughter and Harris are going to be the witnesses. And B Bishop claims to have not only the artifacts that Joseph had, but he's got the small and large crown of Lehi. And, and guess who his witness is going to be? Martin Harris. Harris is like a spiritual gypsy. He just bounces around, and he never denies anything, whether he's in the seances, whether he's joined the shaker. He never denies any of these things. And, and you see, these men are into second sight, and the Whitmers and Page and Cowdery, they're all related. Uh, they're all into this kind of uh, second sight, or the, the scriptural phrase for this is uh, in the eyes of our understanding. And so... They're, they're seeing lots of stuff. They're, they're not seeing it. They're actually perceiving it. But LDS today th think that they're seeing it, but I think it's perceiving it. Uh, but but they, they don't really deny much of anything. And when James Strang comes along, he says, well, Joseph appointed me, and here is, uh, and I was told to get uh, more of the plates of the, of Laban, you know, the Laban mm -hmm. character in the Book of Mormon, and he makes up a set of plates, and, and four individuals dig them up, 
So they sign their testimony. These are ancient plates and so forth. And then another seven witness another set of plates. None of those 11, Joseph Smith had 11. Strang has 11 witnesses, four and seven. Joseph has three, three and eight. And they never, none of them ever deny their testimony, ever. And so this idea that they never deny their testimony is, is not as impressive as it might sound. And Strang's witnesses included some pretty notable names, didn't it? Uh, two of them, and it had been Mormon, I know, <coughs> previously. And, of course, the whole Smith family buys in through revelation that Strang is the successor. William Smith, who's been an apostle of the LDS Church, he says, uh, God told me that Strang has the mantle, and he, you know, they're all ready to go, all ready to join. And they haven't even met the man. That's and, how and easily they're influenced. Emma's ready to join. Emma's. The only one that didn't was Mary Fielding, a Hiram's widow. Okay. Let's take a few more phone calls before we run out of time. We have uh, Galen from Salt Lake. Galen, good to have you with us. Hey, it's good to listen to your program. This is very interesting. I'd like to ask Mr. Palmer, uh, is he an evangelical Christian? If so, is Christianity the basic true religion? If so, what, uh, what are the basic steps to be a Christian? It's obvious to me that he probably doesn't believe in Mormonism as a true Christian religion, so can he address the, get his own ideas uh, about what a Christian is and what he believes now? Thanks. Okay. Um, I wrote my first book to point out the problems of which I, serious foundational problems of the church, but I didn't want to leave it at that, so I wrote a second book called The Incomparable Jesus, and that's where I, I, I think the only honorable thing is to go in that direction, more Christ-centeredness all across the board in the Mormon experience. Um, I think we're coming back next week, and I'm going to talk more about that book, and I'll probably, uh, I, I'll be talking more about an answer to the question that, is, that was just been raised, but uh, we'll take a look of what, it, what, it, what constitutes being a Christian, and, and do a comparison between the Mormon Jesus and the uh, New Testament Jesus. I, I see a number of differences in personality, behavior, attitude, and even doctrinal emphasis. And uh, we'll get into that next week. Okay. We have with us Randy from Coville. Randy, good to have you with us. Yeah, I'm here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, are you? Uh, yeah, hi there. This is Randy from Coville. And uh, I just wanted to call and ask. I've, I've kind of developed a little friendship with the uh, bishop at the seminary across from the high school here, and I kind of complained about why the church is always locked. Um, I, he told me that's because everybody is appointed and they are not compensated. I wanted you to touch on that subject. Okay. I've uh, never been asked that before. Uh, um, I don't know how to really answer that except. Uh, uh, Usually in these church buildings, there's two or three wards in a building, so somebody is usually around there. If you look on the signs it's of the church, it says welcome, but they never give the hours of when the services are, which always seemed a little strange to me. I've, I've had people tell me that if they went to, uh, they wanted to go in and pray, that was always locked up. Uh, I, I, I don't know what answer they would give as to why the building's always locked, but uh, it's true to say they are often locked. Quick question. This is a little bit of a sore subject for me because I've been accused of it for 13 years now. <laughs> uh, you worked full-time for the LDS Church for 34 years. Yes. And they paid you a salary. They did. I'm curious if within the church education system you hear the same kinds of accusations against pastors working full times for other churches being uh, somehow greed motivated if they're trying to feed their families as well or is that something that's just well that's popular? a common misperception I don't know any uh, 
pastors that are getting rich off their ministry, and I there said, are a few, there are some actually. Right, well, I guess if you go <laughs> to Texas, and Joel Austin has you know these huge crowds, and uh, not many Orthodox Presbyterians. I don't know any who are getting rich here in Utah, and no. I'm certainly not getting rich off of book sales, and and my book has been the leading seller at. Uh, from Signature Books since 2002, and I, I don't make that much money off it. I think I got a, a royalty check for six months the other day. It was 288 bucks or something. I mean, that's not exactly a lot of money. You're going to spend that all in one place? Or? I gave it to my wife and the <laughs> account. We put it in our account. I guess okay. that's what. In the in the few minutes we have left, um, I'd like to go back to to the eyes of our understanding. Oh. Uh, most people aren't aware of the fact that there were all these visions in the Kirtland Temple. Can you touch on those for just a couple of minutes? Well, I once talked to one of our historians, T. Edgar Lyon, who I had a lot of respect for. He was over the Nauvoo Restoration Project. And I asked him that question. He says, well, uh, if you fast for two or three days and then drink beer on an empty stomach, you're going to see things. And that was, he was serious about that. I don't know about that, but they're in a culture that thinks a little differently than we do. Uh, we're empirical people. And if you read section 110, the very first verse it says, and the eyes of our understanding were open. That means they're seeing stuff in their mind. And when Moses and Christ and, and Elijah and uh, Elias, which are the same person, when they see them, uh, there are three veils, and Joseph and Rigdon, or Cowdery, sees them. I think what they're doing is perceiving them. They're not seeing them as you and I see one another. The 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants is the same way. We saw Jesus by the eyes of our understanding. Or as participants said in the Kirtland Temple experiences, uh, we saw convoy after convoy of angels all by the eyes of our understanding. That that was known as second sight in a secular phrase, and the witnesses are seen inside Camorra. There's all kinds of uh, experiences where they see inside this hill, and it's uh, been thoroughly studied, and there's no lacuna in that hill, and they, uh, uh, they're seeing tables and plates and swords sheathed and unsheathed, and uh, they take the plates back, and the hill opens up. I mean, this is a different... Uh, mindset than we're used to. But it's become, uh, it, it's become typically interpreted that when the three witnesses or the eight witnesses uh, see the angel or s handle the plates that they're actually physically handling them. This is, if you read their individual testimonies, this is not what they're saying. In fact, the eight witnesses hesita hesitated to sign the document in the what is now in the front of the Book of Mormon. And Joseph had to persuade them to sign it. And I think the reason is because the statement sounds quite physical, and I don't think they're seeing it physically. But he does persuade them, and they do sign. But this is all about uh, second sight, the eyes of our understanding, the spiritual eye, the eye of faith. These are all the same phrases. See, it, see things in the mind. Uh, Joseph is hired as a treasure digger because he can see things in his mind quick question in about a minute if you could touch on how this corresponds to Martin Harris's testimony up in Idaho what does he say there he said quite um, a bit well in terms of his v vision of the plates oh he says he saw it with his spiritual eyes we have three or four comments to that but all of his statements are saying the same thing he says he bounced him on his knee once when they were on a cloth but he even sees uh, the plates under the cloth with his spiritual eyes this is before he's appointed to be one of the three witnesses. And by the way, the three and eight witnesses all saw the plates in a vision before they were selected to be uh, witnesses of the gold plates. So Joseph already has some pretty ready believers, uh, Oliver Cowdery included. He says he saw the plates in a vision uh, when he was in the Smith house and they invited him over. He was school teacher there in the neighborhood. Uh, so you, so it's predicted in the Book of Mormon that three and eight will see it. But but they've already seen him. This is not a 
a startling prophecy for Joseph Smith to put in the book because the men have already seen them in their mind. They see Moroni on a road. They see uh, with the plates of a backpack. They see uh, hanging around the Whitmer Farms. Uh, this it's very very. Uh, you have to, you cannot understand what's going on if you don't understand this spiritual eye, second sight, the eyes of our understanding. It's not quite as impressive as we've been telling it. Well, I want to thank you again for being with us uh, and uh, look forward to having you back next week. It's been a great pleasure to have you. Uh, it is our plan to have Mr. Palmer back with us next week uh, and we're going to be talking more about uh, his experiences and uh, how truth matches up with faith in these matters. The show is sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South here in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, we have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian, that meets in Ogden at 3350 Harrison Boulevard at 9 a.m. And we also have a Bible study in Utah County and one we're trying to get started up in Heber. If you would like more information on us, you can go to our website, www.christpres.net, or you can give us a phone call at 801-969-7948. We are a church that believes that the Bible is God's inerrant, infallible word, that we are sinners saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Till next week. We wish you the Lord's greatest blessings and hope to see you again soon. Good evening. My name is Good Jason night. Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. It is our privilege to have back with us Mr. Grant Palmer. He is a retired uh, employee of the LDS Church Education System. Uh, he retired after 34 years and published a book called An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, and that was followed up by The Incomparable Jesus, another book. It is a great privilege to have him with us. Mr. Palmer, thank you for coming back. Thanks for having me. I'd like to basically recap some of what we saw last week before we move on to some other subjects, because um, some people may not have been with us, and I think that some people may not have been clear on some of this. You were involved for 34 years in the church education system. You've been successful as an LDS missionary. Um, a number of things led you into the church education system. As I understand it, a number of different things that were happening from the Salamander Letter, the Book of Abraham, uh, or the, the Lost Book of Abraham, things like this, a number of things started you questioning uh, the church's popular version of history and the original sources that you were going back and researching. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was a gradual thing. Uh, in my lesson preparations for institute classes, I, I would, uh, you know, I always was open, would read a number of things, and uh, it just seemed to me there's, there were more and more things that were put on the proverbial shelf. and. Uh, especially became uh, uh, troublesome when I was working on my PhD at BYU on in, uh, colonial American history and uh, I began to see just how extensive the King James Bible was used and how much Methodist uh, teaching was, uh, was being taught by the preachers of the Second Great Awakening that were found in the 11 preachers in the Book of Mormon. Uh, that was a, a pretty sized pretty good sized chunk of the Book of Mormon and it kind of went from there. A lot of people have this idea that the, the people who came into Mormonism were coming out of um, a Puritan type background and that this, the Mormonism was this radical departure for them. But you were seeing that actually when you were looking at other contemporary sources, not only were they different from the way they were often presented in modern histories, but also they were right in, in accord with like the Methodist preachers you're mentioning and things like this. Um, the Book of Mormon actually fit right into the landscape of that time, didn't it, in terms of the ideas of, of the, in, the origin of the Indians, the, 
the theology, uh, the issues that were being dealt with, it's, it wasn't anything new, was it? No, not, not the Book of Mormon. The, the more radical doctrines began after the Book of Mormon was published, but uh, you know, Joseph's family, they, they believed in visions. Uh, his mother and three of the children were Presbyterians. Uh, Joseph leaned towards the Methodist. His father and probably Alvin were Universalists. Uh, they had a, a dysfunctional f family religiously, but they're pretty well teaching uh, Protestantism, really, in the Book of Mormon. And that, that's, what, that's what shows up there. In, in the Book of Mormon, you actually have one God. Whereas, one by, God. The, by the time you get to the Book of Abraham, you have a, a, a multitude of gods. Yes, uh, from about 18... Oh, 20 to 34, Joseph believes in one God. In 35 to 38, he believes in uh, uh, two gods, and from 39 on, he believes in a plurality of gods. We know this from uh, his early writings. You, you, you can tell where Joseph's at depending on what he's working on, what God he believes in. If it's the Book of Mormon, it's one God. If it's the Book of, uh, if it, and the Book of Moses, one God. Book of Abraham, he now embraces a plurality of gods, and that's what shows up in the Book of Abraham. The Lectures on Faith, Two Gods, 1835. Um, and, and even in the uh, J Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, he, he, corrects, uh, he corrects the Bible passages to go back to one God when it looks like there might be two gods. So, I mean, you have a very interesting... Uh, way of, of testing Joseph Smith, and that model holds up pretty well. A lot of modern Latter-day Saints don't realize that the lectures on faith actually used to be part of the Doctrine and Covenants. It was the doctrinal portion, right? Yes, it was in there for, till what, 1921? I'm not sure of the date, but it was in there a long time. Yeah, there, a whole, the more you research, the more you find that some of the uh, revelations are uh, greatly uh, extended, some of them are, are greatly shortened or even excised from the Doctrine and Covenants, aren't they? Mainly additions. Mainly additions. But there, there, there are whole sections that were given by Joseph that never appeared in the Doctrine and Covenants. I, I, I remember looking at uh, what would have been section 111, 12, and 13. It was how to remove a church president if he had, had committed wrongdoing or was leading the church astray doctrinally. Today, they, they don't even talk in terms of, they just say, well, God would remove him. But this is a very specific process of a group of state presidents who get together and try the president of the church. That has never appeared in the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, but those revelations are still some that Joseph received. Then there's others that have had uh, additions. A uh, few have been dropped, but mainly additions. Yeah, the one that always jumps to my mind is, uh, was it section 101, I think it was? On marriage? That, on marriage, uh, that was exiled. It, it said that we believe that uh, every woman ought to have but one husband and every man one wife. And uh, this was used to defend the church before polygamy was made public, but ends up getting dropped uh, in what the, was it? 1870s, I think, when they found Yeah, eight. probably, eight, I'm guessing 1870, 71, 76. And by then, of course, <laughs> there were all kinds of polygamy going on, and even publicly announced it in 52 when they came west and uh, entered Utah. The theological issues that were being dealt with in the Book of Mormon were the things that were the, the subject of popular debate, weren't they? Big issues of the time. Where did the where did the Indians come from? The Lamanites was of, or I mean, the, uh, what is called Lamanites in the Book of Mormon and Nephites. Uh, Joseph Smith very firmly believed were Israelites. We know that that is not the case today. They came from Asia, Lake Baikal, out of uh, uh, Mongolia primarily. But uh, yes, this was a leading speculation uh, in the time of Joseph Smith. He just grabbed onto that and. Um, has them leaving Jerusalem and colonizing the Americas. I want to touch on this later uh, in terms of some other things, but in terms of uh, the, the Indians being Lamanites, 
I think it was about 1838, you had the LDS apostles make a declaration in which they said that the Indians were the Israelites, period. Oh, no, I, I yeah. think that's stated in the Book of Mormon a number of times. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's very clearly taught that they are the source. That ends up getting um, downplayed a little bit in terms of the introduction to the Book of Mormon saying that they were, I, I forget the language. Well, that's the later, that's, that's the new one, but basically they were the predominant source. Mm. And then now, um, just in the last few years, they've changed the introduction to say that they're among. Yes, well, you go to the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith receives four, five, six revelations on the Lamanites, and they're, they're referred to as Israelites. And you're to go out and teach them. They're on the borders of uh, the Lamanites, which was uh, in Missouri, Jackson County, Missouri. And, and uh, President Andrew Jackson had all the Indians moved west. And so Oliver Cowdery, Ziva Peterson, uh, two others, uh, all, uh, they went out to teach the Lamanites. And we even know what tribes they are. The, I think they were the Pawnee and the... And I uh, forgot the other one, Pawnee, Shawnee. But they've done DA, DNA testing on these uh, Indians, and that's not so long ago. That's only, mm -hmm. uh, what, four generations since then, and they're, uh, they're not Israelites, not from the Middle East. Brigham Young, who was the Indian agent for the Utah Territory, he told all the Indians they were Lamanites, didn't he? I think every president of the church has, and they... They say it when they dedicate temples, and they, it's really prominent in patriarchal blessings which the church gives to members who ask to know their lineage. I'm curious about something. You know, you taught at the church college in New Zealand. Mm. Do they actually, did they actually teach the Maori that they were Lamanites oh, as well? very much, and they were proud of it. So was their idea that they had come from America to Polynesia? I think their idea was that they had uh, somehow uh, had come from Hawaii. And uh, they, there were several theories, but they very much believed they were, were uh, Lamanites, Nephites, Lehites. Uh, that a group had left the mainland here in America and made their way to Hawaii, and from there they took boats and ended up in that was the predominant thinking. Of course, today we, we know that they came from Indonesia, as I recall. One of the things I think that's striking, you touched on it last week, is that it's not that there had to be one source that Joseph Smith copied, but the idea that the American Indians were descendants of Israel, it's not something that just one other person had come up with. A whole bunch of people were speculating. No, Ethan that. Smith uh, promoted that, and he had, he had gathered up the writings of 40 other authors. This is a very prominent idea. Uh, he was all over Cowdery's, was it Cowdery's pastor? Cowdery's family. I, you know, I, I don't know how intimate Oliver Cowdery was with him, but his mother and siblings certainly were. Yeah, they were members of his congregation there in uh, Vermont. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, essentially questions about how the official history matched up with the original sources and then how the original sources compared to the other things around it. And, and you saw that the Book of Mormon and, and, and so many of these other things, they had these um, contemporary sources that could have been drawn on to create these things. Oh, there's no um, question about it. Joseph Smith is a sponge and a mirror. He takes from over here and he reflects it over there. He's very good at it, too. Uh, we know he used masonry. We know which masonry he moved. It was the, right out of England when they, they brought together two or three strands of masonry. And we know that he used that. He, he, he joined the Masons in Nauvoo, and five weeks later he was giving the Mormon endowment, and it's wholly based on that uh, 17, 19, 17, 20 version. It's the same thing with a lot of his ideas in the afterlife, I think, came from Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh, of Heaven and Hell was his book, and it was very popular beginning in 1808. 
It talks about little children don't need baptism. It talks about three degrees of glory. It talks about marriage in heaven. It talks about spirit world and different v v divisions. But again, you can't always prove, you know, where he got this. But we do know he got uh, at least 25% from the King James Bible because it carries the heirs right into the Book of Mormon of a 1769 edition or later printing. Uh, I think we're pretty safe in saying that uh, Joseph uh, uh, is very aware of the Second Awakening preachers because, like I say, those 11 preachers from Alma, Enos, I mean from Jacob, Enos, up through Alma II, big chunk of the Book of Mormon, uh, they're, they're dead ringers for Second Great Awakening preachers. and. And you can test them in six or seven or eight different ways, and they all match up. Even the first vision was a parallel to, to what you see from other people, even before Smith, in terms of you know, going out to a grove of trees, their prayers, their claims of, of seeing angels. Or, uh, oh, it's lights. very common. Uh, I remember teaching a, an LDS gospel doctrine class, and... I started by saying, in the year 1820, a young man who's 14 years of age uh, went out into the woods to pray uh, because he was concerned, concerned about which church to join, and, and he, he saw Jesus, and his name was Stephen H. Bradley from Connecticut, and the, and the audience said, what? You mean someone else had this common experience? And the answer is, yes, in my insider's view. I. I list maybe 20 sources, as I remember, about young men who, who had this experience like Joseph Smith's forgiveness vision of their sins, and then they went on and became ministers, most of them. That, they felt that was their call to the work. If someone would like, you, you've put together a really nice summary of the various sources for what you think provide a, a large portion of the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, and all. Um, if someone would like to get that from you, how, how can they get that? Uh, I, I think if you want to, to email me at grantHPalmer at gmail.com, I'll send you, uh, it's just a two, two and a half page summary of my book, An Insider's View. And um, I'd be happy to do that. And that's pretty much what we discussed last week. And that'll bring you up to par for, uh, for what, uh, what we discussed last week. Is it also available on your website? It is. And uh, well, they just showed the, the link for that. Oh, so. they just showed it on the screen? Yeah, I yes, you, you can see this. And I, I guess you can uh, copy it as a PDF file. OK. Now. You didn't stop with all this. You began to compare the the substance of what Mormonism taught with, on, in, especially in terms of Jesus, with what you were reading in the New Testament. What did you find? Well, that's a subject that, you know, aside from the foundational problems of the church, and I think uh, they're serious enough, uh, I think another problem is, is what you're asking here. If you compare the Mormon Jesus with the New Testament Jesus, you'll begin to see uh, different personality, different uh, behavior, attitudes, and even doctrinal emphasis. Uh, what I would suggest the, uh, the listener do, don't take my word for it, but I, I think, I think just, just read the four Gospels. Start there. Start with the Gospel of John, and, and Jesus will meet you in the Gospel of John. And then go back and read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then the rest of the New Testament. But if you will disregard the, the chapter headings, just get a good Bible like the NIV, the New International Version, and just read it for what it says. And if you'll do that, I think you'll begin to see some of these differences that I'm, I'm claiming are there. Uh, one of the things that was very useful to me, and I'd pass this on to, to anyone who's uh, interested in making this test themselves, is I, I would like to see people uh, see 
I'd like, I'd like them to see the religious leaders through the eyes of Jesus rather than seeing Jesus through the eyes of their religious leaders. And what I'm suggesting, this is one way to do that. In other words, uh, let's see what he has to say. Has, he, has his personality changed that much? I don't think so. And here's just four or five examples of where I see a, a bifurcated personality. Uh, for example, uh, Jesus, uh, he drank wine. He, he provided at a wedding feast. He, uh, they said the best was, <laughs> you know, what. It was the last of the wedding feast. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the old joke that um, you know Jesus scandalizes uh, many of his professed followers because he's at a party. He's at a party where there's drinking. And not only is he at a party where there's drinking, he provides the alcohol. Yes. And he even says that those who, uh, those who are in heaven with him, they'll celebrate by drinking wine. I think that's no. in the book of Luke, I think. Yeah. Uh, the, um, but you see, to, to Jesus, that's in the, the New Testament Jesus, this is just kind of the way things are. But in the Mormon Jesus, they, he, the Mormon Jesus not only doesn't drink wine, he makes it a test of fellowship. In other words, if you drink wine, you cannot get the ticket to get in the LDS temple you cannot get the ordinance, therefore you cannot live with God, the Father. Well, that's, that's quite an escalation of something that on the surface looks pretty simple. I think the same is true with tithing. Uh, it's true, tithing was in the Old Testament and it was before the Law of Moses. But I don't see any real evidence that Jesus uh, continued that as a law in the early church. Uh, when when he spoke to the rich young ruler, he says, well, you need to give your goods to the poor or a certain amount. And he says, well, I can't do that. But he's giving it to the poor. Uh, when, he, when he talks to Zacchaeus, the publican over the Jericho district, mm -hmm. he does join the church and gives a lot of money. The widows might. And so if you, if you take a look at Romans chapter 16, verse 1, it says, uh, you, you should pay as you're able. It doesn't give a percent, and, and then in 2 Corinthians 9, I believe, it says, uh, uh, be a cheerful giver mm -hmm. to, to, to make the work go. But there's, there's no real law of tithing in there, but once again, this has become a major test of fellowship in the LDS church. You don't pay tithing, you don't get the temple recommend, you don't get the ordinances, and you don't live with God. So we have a bifurcated personality here. Jesus has a very split personality if you start thinking this way between the Mormon Jesus and the New Testament Jesus. Now here's just a couple of more things that, that I won't go into very much, but uh, uh, let's just name a few. It seems to me that Jesus is constantly looking for how to include people rather than exclude them. And... Uh, I think the Mormon Jesus is uh, more often than I would care to mention. They're they're looking for ways to exclude people. For example, if your your daughter's not uh, uh, if you're not an LDS member, you can't go watch her be married. If you're if you don't have a temple recommend or you don't have uh, you're not worthy, you cannot stand in a blessing of a baby circle or a confirmation circle when they receive the Holy Spirit at age eight. They're always, I, I think these are policies, but it, it reflects badly on, I think, uh, the Jesus of the New Testament, because he was looking to include people, not exclude them. I see a difference there, and you can see some of that. Legalism. I, I think the LDS Church in the last 40 years has become much more legalistic. Uh, it's, uh, you can actually start from the head of the top of the head and work on down. And I think Jesus did not like uh, legalistic religion. He just says, look, I teach the things that matter most and leave the rest for an individual. He doesn't say, don't wear an earring if, if you're a male. He doesn't say, I'm against long hair. He doesn't say, I'm against beards. I'm against mustaches. He's more concerned with what comes out of the mouth that defiles than what goes into the mouth that defileth. And you can just go right down the body and uh, 
the Mormon Jesus has a prescription for uh, almost every orifice of the body and uh, uh, even the church issued underwear and they want to know whether you issue, wear it night and day and I, I think if you sat around and talked about it you could come up with maybe 50 to 75 of these starting up here and, and going on down and um, one of, one of so it's more of a legalistic versus a, a, a more of a, a invitational type of thing. One of the things that's striking to me, I know I touched on this last time, but I hear it um, a fair number of times every year. Um, a lot of LDS, or at least a, a fair number of them, still view um, pastors as hirelings of Satan, as motivated by money and everything else. Um, we actually do believe in tithing, but but we but we teach it as a as a matter between the individual and God. I purposely stay ignorant of what people give. The session, mm -hmm. the the elders of the church don't know what individuals give. Mm -hmm. Our treasurer does because he handles the finances, but he purposely keeps that. Um, Hmm. Well, well, at the LDS church, it's, but, but you actually have to. They just say ten percent, and then it's it's between you and God. But they they say ten percent, right? And people who say that aren't very aware of their own scripture, because in I think it's section twenty or forty two of the Doctrine and Covenants, it's, it talks about the law of remuneration. And the law of remuneration is that if you're full time in the kingdom, you should get paid. We don't emphasize that very much. You ought to try it on them because it's right in there. It's well, called the law of remuneration. I, I don't get very far because I, I mention people working full time in the church education system. I mention uh, other full people working full time for the LDS church, but that doesn't seem to count. No, I, I, I'm in it. I'm supposedly in it for the money um, because I'm full time. Well, but, um, anyway, I want to I want to focus more on, on Jesus in the time we have left. But but before we go any further, I want to open up the phone lines. If you'd like to join in the conversation, our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. We have with us Grant Palmer. He is a retired Institute of Religion Director in the LDS Church, a couple of, or several different campuses, 34 years in the church education system. He is the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins and The Incomparable Jesus. I want to focus on what you were saying and, and flesh that out a little more in terms of the externals versus the internal. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I may disagree in terms of a few things about externals and such and where th that is, but I, I think we're in complete agreement that the focus is that it's not a change from the outward in. It's, a, ch it's a change from, from the heart outward that it is it is this new heart i've never been a latter-day saint I'm, I'm viewing things as an outsider um the impression i get and i know there's a, a huge spectrum but among those who are are f faithful serious latter-day saints there seems to be this 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 mysticism I mean, they, they can get very misty-eyed very quickly talking about Jesus. But, it, it, but beyond that, there doesn't seem to be very much focus. The focus seems to be on the temple. The focus seems to be on um, Fast Sunday and on um, you know, all the various other things. It doesn't, and it, it amazes them when I say this is a different Jesus and a different gospel because um, they're like, we have Jesus' name in, our, in, our, in the name of our church. Um, well, they did drop his name. They close in the name of Christ. They sing about him in the sacramental prayers. But as far as the life and ministry in the in sacrament meeting, you very seldom hear, hear a sermon about Jesus Christ. And the same is true in the Relief Society priesthood. In fact, I had uh, the presidents of the church for, what, 10 years. And uh, I, I've I think there's less than 10% of those lessons that have to do with Jesus Christ. They like to focus on institutional LDS beliefs and organizational needs. Uh, Jesus Christ just falls through the cracks. Uh, 
I'd say 10%. That's, I actually did a survey on it. In fact, it's in the Incomparable Jesus, uh, where I think I went up through seven or eight years of that. And out of 192 lessons, I would say less than 20 were actually talking about Jesus Christ. And, and part of the problem is they have four standard works. So they take one standard work each year. That means that they only spend in Sunday school, LDS Sunday school, about four months every four years on the, on the Gospels. And then they move on to Paul. Uh, so they're, they're not really spending a lot of time. And then it's often seen through the eyes of the Book of Mormon. So uh, you, you don't get a bunch of a focus there. Um, but it was Jesus who said, we must be born again. And I'm not an evangelical Christian. And that emphasis is in LDS scripture in Mosiah and Alma in the Book of Mormon, but they just kind of choose not to talk about it. And yet it's, it's the a, central teaching of Jesus in the New Testament along with the resurrection of Christ. It's actually used as a pejorative among many Latter-day Saints. They're born again, or, you know, they're, uh, isn't it? They think they're born again when they're baptized, but read First John, all, all five or six chapters, and he, he just spells it out. You're born again if you, and he, he spells out about six or seven things, and you'll soon find out that you're not born again just because you're baptized. And uh, I, I really think that Jesus was not really caught up in your right beliefs as much as he was your right actions. And for him, the sermon on, he is the Sermon on the Mount. That's what it means to be a Christian. And those... That Sermon on the Mount goes back to one of those eight, seven or eight Beatitudes, and the rest of the New Testament is going back and can fit under one of those seven or eight teachings. Peter has nine, he says, look, I observed Jesus for three years in 2 Peter chapter 1, and he lists them. And Paul has the same nine. And John, this is a, this is a big deal in the New Testament to be born again to become a little Christ, as, as C.S. Lewis would say. Um, I'm curious, um, when you started reading the New Testament, uh, no longer through the, the prism of what you had been taught, but trying to let the, the text speak for itself, did you see parallels between Phariseeism with their concern with the outward uh, long list of, of moral codes and things like that. Oh yes, the legalistic, uh, the legalistic Jesus uh, versus not legalistic. Oh, I, I think he really detested it. And I, like I say, I think in the last 40 years the Mormon Jesus is, uh, at least the church, is, is moved in the direction of legalism. As an outsider, one of the things I try to, to communicate to people is how uh, so many Mormons seem to set up a cheap worldly grace uh, where you know, it's an easy believism in the extreme as the as the only alternative to Mormonism and then lampoon it. Well, it's a, it's a straw man. In Mormonism it seems as if you have to merit the merit of Christ. You, Jesus, will, Jesus will save you from your sins but you have to get out of them first you know, to some extent. Mm -hmm. Cheap grace says, well, Jesus will save you in your sins but he doesn't necessarily have to save you from your sins. He can leave you to wallow in them for the rest of your life. The gospel presents that Jesus will save us in our sins. He says to the Pharisees, the, tax, the prostitutes and tax collectors will enter the kingdom before you because they repented. He'll save us in our sins, but he doesn't leave us there. He, he gives us that new heart. He gives us that new birth. Yeah, the new, the new birth and his grace, we can't do it on our own. Okay. And... Let me go ahead and squeeze in our first call here. Uh, we have with us Greg from Roy. Greg, good to have you with us. Oh, thank you. Hey, um, this is for Grant. Grant, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to tell you thank you for the two books you wrote. Uh, for many years I was troubled over things that just confused me about the gospel and about the church and, you know, things in the Book of Mormon and when I finally read your book, it just answered so many questions and cleared things up for me. And, you know, I, I've gone to my bishop many times and asked questions, and they just get mad at you. And, and you know, I'll tell you not to worry about it. And so I wouldn't. And I just have faith. But 
So anyway, um, I just want to tell you thanks. I really appreciate you. You know, for several years now, I've, I've wanted to tell you thank you. And so thanks, Grant. I appreciate you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. If you'd like to join in the conversation, the phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. I'm curious for your take on this as well. In, in the Bible, I see Jesus as the end. In Mormonism, to a great extent, when you get past a lot of the sentimentality, a lot of the emotion, the other things, it just seems as if Jesus is a means to an end. Well, is, is that a, do you think that's a fair assessment? It depends on the individual, but I think you're pretty much right. Jesus Christ is enough, and Joseph Smith doesn't matter. That's, a, that's two ways of putting it. Uh, again, just take a look at the Bible. What does Jesus say about charity? He says, do it in secret. He didn't say take a reporter with you when you're going to do charity and humanitarian aid. Yeah. And there are just so many different behaviors of the New Testament versus the, uh, the Mormon Jesus. It, it, it starts to, I mean, we're talking about several dozen here. I, I'm just bringing yeah. out a few. I mean, the whole antithesis section of the Sermon on the Mount, where he's really striking at this, this um, focus on the externals among the Pharisees. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't mar your face so that people know you're fasting. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't make these long prayers. And, you know, um, what does and, Jesus call them? He says, these are traditions of the elders. Ignore them. They, 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 these are straining at gnats. Don't worry they, about it. Yeah, they're, 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 they're hypocrites, which is a term that we don't often understand the, the root of it. They're actors. They're doing these things to be seen by other people. They don't, you know, Jesus makes clear the only audience that really matters is God. Yeah. And he's a whole lot more demanding than legalists like to think. Mm hmm. Well, and the Mormon Jesus is not only uh, more legalistic, he's more authoritarian. He's almost like a CEO. And Jesus gets down among the people. And, you know, I, I, in all fairness, this was a small group back then, and it's a big church now. But if you go into even 3rd Nephi, which is a comparable time period to the New Testament, when Jesus appears, notice as you start reading, say, chapter 18, I command you to do this, and I command you to do that. And Jesus is invitational when he's talking to believers. Uh, Jesus is, the New Testament Jesus is not near as authoritarian as the third Nephi. Go to, go to third Nephi 18, and they'll say, well, Jesus says, uh, you may not be able to take the sacrament, your religious leaders, ecclesiastical leaders may decide that for you. In the New Testament, it's between you and God period. Because no one's, you know, they, they just leave it that way. It's more between you and God in Third Nephi. It's, well, no, your ecclesiastical leaders can make that decision who does and does not take the sacrament. Notice how many times, even in the Sermon on the Mount in Third Nephi, it's verily, verily, I say this, but really, really notice how many times Jesus is invitational in the New Testament and how I command you to do this and I command you to do that. It's, it's a different and if you, if you look at 3 Nephi 9, where 16 cities are destroyed, uh, it almost sounds like Jesus is, is, is almost an Old Testament vindictive God, and he almost seems to have joy in how this city, and I personally caused this city, Zarahemla, to burn with fire, and this one slipped into the sea, and this one was buried with mud, and so forth and so on. Anyway, just I, I don't want to make a, you know, a, a black and white distinction, but I think it reflects Joseph Smith's personality because he was more that way. He was more uh, authoritarian and, uh, and more uh, that way. But uh, anyway, there, there's another difference. There are all kinds of differences, and I, I would hope that the, the reader would, uh, or the listener tonight would do their own study. I think this is important stuff.
So you find a different personality, different attitudes, different behavior, and different doctrinal emphasis. I think why the born again, uh, to be born again, you must be born again, Jesus says in, in, in John 7, or 3, 7. Uh, I would, I've asked four or five people in this past week, what do you think is the number one teaching of, 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 of Mormonism? And they say to be obedient to their leaders. Well, that's, that's really, a, a, I'm sure there's room for disagreement there. I want to flesh this out. Um, let me preface it. We're going to take some phone calls in between, but let me preface before we take the phone calls. Um, in the Bible, I see basically Jesus standing between us and the church to some, in, in, in a sense, in that Jesus calls us to himself, and through him we're united with the church. Whereas in Mormonism, it seems as if the church has been put between us and Jesus. And, you know, in the Bible, Jesus is saying, Come unto me, all you who uh, are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's mm -hmm. very personal, very direct. One mediator between God and man. Let's come back to that. I, I want to not lose my train of thought there, but um, let's take, our fruit, or take some more calls. Uh, we have first Herman from Provo. Herman, good to have you with us. Herman? Yes, hello. You're on the air. Hello? You're on the air. Okay, I have a, a question to ask you. I have a really good friend. His son got married in the temple, in Manti Temple. And, and I talked to his uh, father, and he had tears in his eyes. And I asked him, what's the man? And he says, well, Herman, he says, I cannot go see his, my son get married in the Manti Temple because I don't pay my tithing. Now, is that fair? Is it, it just upsets me when I see something like that. Jesus didn't want us to do that. Well, you're right on. Yeah. It really hurts my feelings that his wife, his mother, and his dad had tears in his eyes when he talked to me. He says, Herman, I feel very bad. I cannot see my son get married in the temple. And that's just a policy. That's not a doctrine. It's a policy. It's not a doctrine, but you've got to have your ticket to go into the temple yeah. to see his son get married. Yeah, I think it's a matter of control. They like to control I'm sure they have other reasons, but uh, these are things that they they could separate. They could separate doctrine from from uh, culture and policy, and uh, I think they they need to do a good deal of that, separate it out. Herman, thank you for the call. Uh, we're going to go next to Bill in Provo. Bill, good to have you with us this evening. Hello. You're on the air. I I can't hear you. You're on the air. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. My question is, first of all, I have a question and a comment. Is Grant Palmer a, a member of the LDS Church still? I just feel like I've graduated from the LDS Church. I haven't gone for about uh, eight, seven years, actually. So have, have you been excommunicated? or? No, no, I haven't been excommunicated. I was, I was disfellowshipped in... Uh, 2004 uh, f for writing my book, An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Well, I think it's important that the TV, there are the people that are watching your TV show need to know that because some, a lot of the things that you're saying are false and they don't represent the church. And a lot of people are going to watch the show thinking everything you say is what the LDS Church actually teaches. For example, what you said about Jesus Christ. I go to the LDS Church and we talk about Jesus Christ every single Sunday. You know, some, some words actually do, but if you interviewed 100 people, you're going to get a large majority that won't agree with you. But, but you're talking about people. You're not talking about the church. You're talking about people that make mistakes. No, it's They're, not about a make, not matter about of Jesus making Christ mistakes. Christ. It's a matter yeah, about what you want to set for a, poli a, a policy. Do you want to f focus more on Jesus Christ or not? And right now, they, are, or they, they choose to let... You know, they, they, will, they will assign people to talk about uh, uh, principles, but principles detached from Jesus. You can find all these principles attached to Jesus Christ, and principles are always more interesting when they're part of a person's life rather than just 
off by themselves. But you're right, there, there, are, there are congregations that talk about Jesus on a regular basis. If you ask a lot of people, well, does Mormons really celebrate Easter Sunday? A lot of Mormons say, not really. Easter is huge for us. The resurrection of Christ is one of the biggest days of the year for us. Uh, I'd have to disagree with you on that. Uh, while they, they say that, they don't show it in their meetings on Sunday morning. Maybe your ward does, but I'm just saying if you ask a hundred Mormons from a, from a wide range, ask them what happens on Easter Sunday, they, they will probably say there's not a lot going on. In fact, Sometimes they'll have fast and testimony meetings on Easter or state conference, and uh, Jesus gets a pretty short shrift. This is one of the things that I hear a lot from folks. Um, whenever there's any criticism, and I mean even when you're quoting their own sources, often you will hear people say that, um, well, that's not true. You're misinformed. But You've been a Mormon for how long? Seventy years. Uh, your whole life, your your family on all sides goes back to the pioneers, basically. Um, and yet, you know, the criticism from the fair folks, the the LDS apologetics website, is that you're not an insider. And you know, here's a young man saying that you're not accurately representing things. And yet, this is what I hear from a host of people including active LDS. And, I mean, there have been some changes. We'll, we'll talk about those if time permits, but um, no, no critic is ever giving the truth, uh, except when you start actually sitting down and trying to quantify things, and then you find out they really are telling the truth. Let's well, go to our next call. Well, I've certainly um, been around. I, I spent three years in New Zealand in the church. I spent two years in Virginia, North Carolina. I lived in Northern California, Southern California, New Zealand. Uh, I, I, I've been around the church. It's not like I, I, I kept my eyes shut. These are observations of my lifetime. Going to Ray and Murray. Ray, good to have you with us. I'm, yeah, I'm here. You're on the, you're on the air. Uh, good evening. Okay, thank you. I had to get the TV turned off. Ed, uh, you referred a few minutes ago to some scriptures about being born again. And I'm sorry, but I, uh, he didn't give the references to those. I would be very, and I'm sure they're there. I'm very interested in those. He said that there were eight or nine things uh, that uh, he listed that were uh, the same in two or three different uh, places that he said. I just like the references for those. And if you can't get the exact chapter and verse, just say what they are and I, so I can look them up. I'd appreciate that. What, Gospel of John, chapter 3, what is it, verse 19? Uh, John 3, 7. 3, you, 7. You must be born again. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is what Jesus is saying is the definition of a Christian. Second uh, Peter, chapter 1. Peter gives nine things, and then Paul, I think it's in Galatians 5, yeah, the, the 22 and 3. Works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. And then 1 John, uh, All of look, first at, John. look at what it means. The whole, whole small book uh, talks about the importance of being born again and describes the born again person. Well, the, the thing that Jesus wants to focus on, I, I, and if you'd like a more fleshed out Hopefully he turned his TV back up. <laughs> Sorry. Version of that. Uh, I recommend you you get for 10 bucks, you can buy the incomparable Jesus, and it goes into great lengths on this subject. Here's something I observed when I, when I read the New Testament through just what it says. I was amazed how many times Jesus said the following. They want, he, he was desire, desirable that they focus their behavior on him. Notice how many times. Come unto me, learn of me, continue with me, draw nigh unto me, come after me, watch with me, hearken unto me, look unto me, follow me, hear me, confess me, gather with me, remember me, seek me, believe on me, find me, live by me, know me, serve me, see me, receive me, love me, dwell in me, honor me, abide in me, ask me, testify of me, and be witnesses unto me. I am, I am the way and the truth 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he is very much a jealous God that way. And that's why he wants you to focus on his life. And when you begin to look at his parables and his teachings, it, it tells you something about Jesus Christ himself, about his person, about his personality, and what he thinks is important. And then he, and you go from there. That's what it means uh, to be a Christian. And when, you, and when you take on sufficiently those characteristics, his promises are, uh, his promises are that uh, my, my peace I give unto you, secondly, what is, uh, my spirit shall teach, bring all things to remember whatsoever I have said. Uh, I will love you and manifest myself in your life. And what's the fourth one? Uh, forget. Uh, um, Uh, let's see, I, my spirit sh shall teach you, oh, I, I mentioned that one, I am with you always. Those are, yeah. those are great promises, and you really can't overcome the world without his guiding grace and emphasis, which he will provide when he sees that you're trying to do these eight or nine things that Peter, Paul, John, and Jesus all talk about. Well, that, that being born again is actually him coming in and dwelling us. Yes, I mean, infusing you know, us with Paul, his feeling spirit. Paul, Paul, Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Yes. And um, the, going back Putting to... Putting on Christ. Uh, right. The, this is what I was talking about earlier. It seems as if there's this tendency to put, in LDS view, to, to put the church between us and Christ. The, the flip side of it, on the evangelical side, I get very frustrated when I hear what often passes as evangelism when people tell Latter-day Saints, you don't need a church, all you need is Jesus. They're partially correct, but to some extent it's, they're divorcing the bridegroom from the bride, the, they're severing the head from the body. Well, groups of but, people can do yeah, things that individuals can't do, and so but that the, hence the need of a church. But, but for that rather, alone. But rather than coming to Christ through the, the LDS church, it, the, the biblical picture is we come to Christ directly. As you just said, come to me, you know, I'm with you always, the focus there on the, the personal. It's coming through him and being united to him that we're then also united with his people. Mm. But it's a, it's, a, it's a result, it's not going through the church to get to him. If so to speak, is that does that make sense? I, I don't know. That resonates with me as much as, as I'm an maybe out, I'm you. an outsider, and I I have a different. I found mindset. Jesus Christ in the LDS Church, but I had to really work at it on my own, and I, I think that's probably enough to say on that. Uh, Let me try to squeeze in one more call here. Um, we're running short on time. We have Joanne from uh, North Ogden. Joanne. Hello. You're on the air. Yes. You need to be brief. We're running um, out of time. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Palmer about uh, Ethan Smith. I've heard of him, and I don't know much, but I have heard that he wrote the book of Book Mormon. Okay. Oh, he was actually Thank a congregational you. preacher up in Vermont, and Oliver Cowdery's family were members of his congregation in the. We talked quite a bit about that last week, and uh, uh, if you want to learn more about that, go to uh, Book of Mormon Studies by B. H. Roberts, or I, my book, an, in, an Insider's View of Mormon Origins, it talks more about that. I, I would, I'd, I'd like to finish up more on what we're talking about Jesus here, because it's not just what he taught. Jesus gave eight discourses. And his eighth discourse is in Matthew 24 and 5. And this, this is just a few days before they crucify, the, the state crucifies him. And he says, and they come to him privately and he says, tell us when are you going to return and how are you going to judge mankind? And Jesus gives these three parables and they're a very practical thing. The first parable is the ten virgins and he simply says, uh, five were foolish and five were wise. The five that were f foolish, they don't know me. 
And that's coming back to what I've been talking about most of the night. They were not born again. They did not take upon the moral image of Christ. And he says, you won't be going to heaven if you don't take upon yourself the nature of Christ. The second is about the parable of the pounds. And remember, he gave one pound, two pounds, five pounds. And then he says, I went on a long journey and I came back. It means I'm not coming right away from your point of view. But when he comes back, he, he, he has an accounting of his stewards, and the person who had two and five doubled them, but the one who had one did nothing, he buried it. So the second thing I think he's looking at, besides taking upon ourselves the image of Christ, being born again, the second focus is in that parable of the pounds, and he says, I want, I'm going to want to know what you've done with your life and time on earth. And then the third one is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And he, this is where he says, when I come back, I'll divide all nations between the sheep and the goats. And then he defines what a sheep is. And it's a person who, who uh, feeds the poor, uh, helps the widows, uh, visits the prisoners, and so forth and so on. Uh, I, think, I think those are, are, are important. Uh, and then he, he does the flip side of that and says, goats are those who do not do that. But if you've done it unto the least of these, my brother, and you've done it unto me. Notice what he doesn't say in there. He doesn't say, well, now, did you pay all this money? Did you have all these uh, higher ordinances? Did you go to the temple? Did you do this? Did you pay this money? No, it's a very pragmatic thing. And that's the way I see Jesus. And he's the one that says he's going to judge us. So I think we ought to take a serious look at Matthew 25 because he is saying what he's going to be looking for. The image of God, what have you done with your time and talents, and did you help? Were you part of the answer, or part of the problem on the earth? That's who makes it to heaven. Well, we're unfortunately out of time. The, the hour goes quickly. <laughs> but uh, it has been a great privilege to have you with us. If anyone would like to see more on these things, they ha uh, you have a website that we'll put back up here. Um, and your two books are an insider's view of Mormon origins and the incomparable Jesus. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us. Our show is sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is our only infallible rule of faith and practice. We try to go through those scriptures and see Jesus on a regular basis. If you'd like more information, you can go to our website, www.christpres.net, or you can give us a call at 801-969-7948. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South, Main Street Magna, and we have a sister congregation in Ogden, Berean Presbyterian Church. We invite you to worship with us soon. Until next time, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night.